Okay, so here's the thing. When you're five years old, you love being five years old. Five years old is what you know. Five years old is what you are. Five years old is what's comfortable to you. And you look at those who are older than you and you're keenly aware that they're older than you. And a part of you wants to imitate those you consider older than you, whether they really are or not. You don't know the difference. And a part of you wants to pretend, oh, I'm going to be a grown-up. And you, you know, you, you copy. Now, when you're 10 years old, you begin to despise earlier ages as well. You start to look at those who are older than 10 and think that they're grown up or closer to grown up and the urge to copy them is even higher but you've also got this <clears throat> urge to look down on those who are younger than you because you're not really you're just starting to leave childhood okay and you're starting to become aware at about 10 that there are differences amongst humans and so you're naturally going to latch on to those who you regard as older or better and imitate them and you're going to mimic and you know repeat the attitudes and mores and hearsay and all the values that are around you because that's what humans do they're imitators that's how we learn that's why the mosaic law was written the way it was to, to be best learned by imitation by repetition and so the people we grow up around who we know or think are older or better than us we imitate them and then those we think are younger or less than us we're going to start to despise now the despising usually comes in around 7 age 7 to age 10 it's in full swing at age 12 because you know you're too close to having been a child and you don't want to be a child anymore at that age. You want to be a man. And you're so far from being a man, but you don't know that. Your body's starting to become reproductive. And there's a certain desire, therefore, to say, I'm grown up. And that's, you know, the hardest part of life. is basically between age 12 and 20. Because you have to sort of start choosing where you fit in the world. And that's based on very little information. And it's all hearsay and it's all, you know, herd bound. It's a real hard time to live. Now, this is the way it is for most people. And most people do not grow out of the age 12 to age 20 phase. It's too much to deal with and pretty much I don't know how much the percentage has got to be like 80% or more of the human race is mentally and emotionally stuck in the age 12 to age 20 and you know that right away because there's so much nostalgia and longing and praising of childish values belonging to that phase of life. You know, all the family stuff, all the rah rah Jesus songs, all the uh, sort of wistfulness of childhood, and oh, we were looking back on high school and junior high and childhood friends and how carefree we were as kids. You know, all that stuff is overpraised and overvalued because 
People don't want to grow past it. They don't want to grow up. It's too hard. So, at this point in life, most people think that the ultimate in life is to get married, and they almost always marry too young. They get married, and now they're accepted by their peers, because peer pressure is a real big deal at this point in life, between 12 and 20. And because they're doing all that so early, they're not getting a higher education, or they're not paying much attention to whatever higher education they're getting. And so they start to settle too early in a job, too early in this, too early in that. And they really just don't go very far. And they make a virtue out of not having any progress. There are so many stories about people who are stuck in their minds in their glory days of high school or college. And you never grow past that. So, of course, you know, jobs open to them are pretty limited. And there are so many people like them that, you know, those jobs don't pay very well because the supply is so good. And anybody who came from the neighborhood who doesn't turn out like that but instead goes on to higher education or even moves out of the neighborhood... And starts making a decent living and all these other things that happen to the few. Those people who leave, who grow faster or higher past the 12 to 20 stage in their minds. Those people are pretty well resented. You go back to a college reunion, a high school reunion. And you will notice that a whole lot of people you used to admire when you were very young, between 12 and 20, they basically stayed stuck in that mindset. And you moved on. And when you come back, you realize how small-minded they are. And why am I talking about all this? The Christian way of life is exactly the same thing. Essentially, all this stuff about the battle and the war of independence... You're, you're really outgrowing humanity. Humanity is a kind of parochial condition in the mind. We have our limitations in our bodies, but that's nothing compared to the, the limitation of the mind. The human mind thinks like a person who's between 12 and 20. That's usually the happiest time of most people's lives. And they want to keep going back to it. And of course, if you're getting married at 20, you are repeating that same phase of your life. Because now you're going to start having kids. And so by the time you're 32, let's say you got married at 20. By the time you're 32, well, you're back at age 12 again because you've got a 12-year-old. So you never really get out of that narrow lifestyle. Never see the big picture. It's always about your local friends and family. You you have you really cannot process the big picture Bible doctrines at all. Because your mindset just isn't working that way. And by the time you're thirty two, honey, it's almost too late. It's never technically too late. But it's very, very hard to get into big picture thinking by the time you're thirty two if you haven't done so already. Especially if you started your family young. It's really hard. It's hard to get out of the, you know, remember the story and back to the future. I forget who, who the actor was. But, you know, the lead actor guy, um, Michael, I forget his last name. His character's last name was McFly. And there was this big bully that was always bullying him and trying to get his girlfriend. Okay, that big bully turned out to be a real loser in the same town, you know, some years later. And the whole film is, you know, based on alternate universes and what happens if you mess with time. 
But that whole small town, small minded lifestyle is pretty much how most people live. You know, with varying qualities of, of goodies. In the Christian life, that's how it goes too. The small minded, parochial, you know, um, bully mentality or the McFly family mentality is is mainstream Christianity. They think that doing good is Christian way of life and if you nod to God on Sunday then you're a good Christian and you give to the poor and you sit and you say, Oh brother and oh sister and you know you, you sing a hymn or two every Sunday and and you're polite you know and you don't divide the body because you just agree with everybody and therefore compromise the Bible. But that's okay because it's Christian love. That kind of Laodicean attitude is Christianity. They're all stuck in that parochial 12 to 20 um, mindset. And that's where their spiritual life is stuck to. Although most Christians don't even get to age 12. I mean, if you're still asking questions about whether God is one or three, or how to be saved, if you still have to deal with those questions, you, you're, you haven't even gotten to 10th, you know, 5th grade, spiritually. You're not even age 10. And even the great theologians, none of them got beyond, I don't know, adolescence. None of them. Pick any theologian you want to name. And they they couldn't figure out the nature of God if, if the Bible bit them. It's really disgusting. It's one of the biggest, most upsetting facts to learn. Is that all your famous names in Christianity for the past 2,000 years were idiots. Really idiots. I mean, I think I can count on one hand five people that actually started to get a glimmer of what it was all about, but they never got a chance to write it out. So if they did know better, there's no way to prove it. But as far as what's in writing, it's all idiocy. I feel sorry for anybody who has to be a pastor or go to seminary, because you spend hours and hours and hours reading sheer drivel. Absolute drivel. Calvin was like five years old spiritually. And here we have a spiritual life where you outgrow your humanity. You outgrow all those childish issues and, and you know, blithering statements. You know, Calvin goes on for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And after speaking, writing for 60 minutes worth of reading, you know what? He never said anything. And it's like that with most of the theologians. They just froth at the mouth and there's no substance. So you outgrow all that too. You outgrow the 12 to 20 stage in the spiritual life. And you realize how much different the spiritual life really is versus what people think it is. And you're seeing all that and it's very tiring. The biggest thing you're doing is you're outgrowing your humanity in order to have a closeness with God. So it's understandable that one of the big hassles you're going to have are growing pains. And I haven't dealt enough with this, you know, one of the kinds of battles you end up fighting is wherever you are spiritually, there's going to be around you a certain number of people who should be the same age as you spiritually because they've been in the spiritual life for as long, but they didn't grow like you did. So it's going to be real irritating to be around them. And they're going to be irritated by you because you're basically this walking signpost of their failure, even though you don't mean to be. So they're going to resent you. I mean, you've sort of heard me say this before, but what I'm hitting on this time is 
the difference in spiritual ages is a whole lot like the difference in human psychological and emotional ages. And when a person stays down too long, stays too childish too long, when you're 50 years old and you're still looking at the good old days between 12 and 20, you're emotionally and psychologically stunted. And you're going to be prickly and you're going to know, subconsciously at least, that you are stunted and you're going to resent anybody who isn't. So the bulk of humanity enjoys this t age 12 to 20 emotional psychological state so therefore that's the same you know the same rule applies um, with respect to spiritual you know spiritual maturation and it's real hard to be around those people because when you're 50 going on 12 that's too much of a divergence you should have grown up by the time you're 50. And so anybody who has is a stick in your throat because it's real obvious that they're the same chronological age but much more mature than you. So the spiritually immature will actually resent, of course won't understand, will resent the spiritually mature, but here's the next kicker. The spiritually mature are actually growing out of being human. So the difference is, is exacerbated. See, the whole idea is to mature in weakness. The idea is to learn, you know, loyalty down, loyalty up. To learn to love the low. I haven't learned this lesson yet, I just know that's what the lesson is. To learn to love the low. Well, it's easy to love the low if it's a cute, freckle-faced kid who you tell him to do something that his little kid brain can understand, and he happily does it. It's a whole different ball game if that kid is a screaming brat who constantly set, sets your, your garage on fire. It's real hard to love a kid like that. And of course, if you're not the the immediate parents, then you got all those other parents around saying, Oh, it's just a cry for help. And you shouldn't spank Johnny. Yeah, if you had spanked Johnny early and often enough, he wouldn't be setting garages on fire. This is the other thing about human nature. We need to be spanked. We will not listen until we are. That's why war has to be fought. For some people, until you hit them in the gut, real hard, and smack them upside the wall, they won't listen. They won't hear what you've got to say. They can't listen to reason. They can't even process it. Why? Because they're age 12 and want to stay that way. See, it's one thing to really be age 12 and you don't know any better, but it's another to refuse to mature. And in the Christian life, you're looking at 99% of Christians who refuse to mature. And they're ugly, baby. They're ugly, they're stupid, they love being ugly and stupid. They love being age 12 spiritually. They love preening themselves on their puerile ideas of things. And it's really irritating to be around. And what you, you have to really resist the urge to just smack them upside the wall which is what they desperately need. But see, you're not their parents. It's up to God to do the smacking, and you just have to wait. Now, it's most uncomfortable with people who should be near you in age, but are not. It's less uncomfortable with people who you know they're trying, they're interested, but you know what? They got a long way to go. They're still back in kindergarten, and here you are in the graduate course, learning how to graduate from even being human. And, and they don't know two plus two. 
And a whole bunch of them are going to get mad at you because you're not like them. And a whole bunch more will just fawn over you because you're not like them. But, but both of them are just kids. You're learning to rule that way. Because one of the biggest things, and I'm not saying I'm getting it because I'm not. One of the hardest things about ruling is how do you rule the brats? It's easy to rule kids who are fresh-faced and, you know, obviously innocent and all those other things about kids, you know, when they're cute and they're genuinely interested. They can't process anything because they're kids, but it's not due to a lack of will. You know, when you're talking about, what was it, uh, uh, what's the name of that show? Mm, it was on Fox. Simpsons, the Bar the Simpsons. Bart Simpson was always a brat. And Lisa Simpson was the ideal student. Because she was well behaved, he was an idiot. It's real easy to love a Lisa, but it's not so easy to love a Bart. Well, there are a whole lot of Christian Barts. And in Christian way of life, the only reason you're immature is because you want to be. There's no there's no advantage to any any given human based on um, age or gender or economic background or anything else. Because nobody grows spiritually except that God enables it, period, over and out. You can have an IQ of room temperature on a cold Chicago day and you can learn more Bible doctrine in the same amount of time versus a PhD in Greek. And just a sad fact of life that you can have all the degrees and all the smarts on the planet, but honey, the Bible's spiritual information. I mean, it's nice to have the PhD and everything and hopefully that'll help you, you know, be motivated to pay more attention. And use 1 John 1 9. But honey, if you're not using 1 John 1 9, I don't care how smart you are. You learn nothing. You recite the Bible upside down and backwards and you know nothing. So there are a whole lot of people out there with degrees. And they're respectable. And they got, you know, their community that admires them. And they know the Bible backwards and forwards and all the languages and all the dictionaries and lexicons and everything else. And honey, they don't know a thing. They're spiritually age five. So then you got all that huffiness to deal with too. And there's this constant war of comparison with all these kids just clamoring all the time. Whether they're clamoring at you deliberately or just they're in your periphery. The knowledge waits. The knowledge is heavy. You're seeing as God sees. That's the whole game here. But you're also growing beyond human. You're learning to love righteousness. Which ends up having this whole facet that Christians don't even know about. You're not loving righteousness if you're not loving unrighteousness. Really loving it. Really loving it. Not saying, oh, this is right and this is wrong. That's not loving righteousness. That's imitating ABCs about righteousness. If you actually love something, you're paying attention to it, not to yourself. And you can't love righteousness without also loving unrighteousness. Really loving it. Wanting to give your all to it. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean you should go out and get drunk and whore around and do drugs? And That's not loving unrighteousness. People who do all those things do not love unrighteousness. See, love means you want to benefit the object. Okay, how do you benefit righteousness? How do you benefit unrighteousness? Do I benefit unrighteousness if I go out and get drunk? No. Why? Because unrighteousness is a kind of illness. Unrighteousness is something that causes harm. Okay, well, if you love something that causes harm, you find ways not to do it. You don't want to do it. If I respect or love unrighteousness, 
And it's obviously unrighteous to get drunk, for example, on purpose. But then I'm not going to get drunk. And then I'm loving the unrighteousness of being drunk. I'm caring for it. I'm taking care of it. I'm respecting its, as it were, power. Power to wreck life. Power to wreck your, your evening, at least. You see the point? Well, it's real hard to love, brats. Well, that's unrighteousness. It's real hard to love people who are younger than you and yet close to you, either in periphery or chronological age or social status or whatever. And it's real hard to do that. And it's real hard to love yourself. And of course, above all, it's really hard to love God because His standards are so total all the way down to the bottom. Where the brats are. And all this time you're spending, be good, be good, be good, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. And then on the other flip side of the ledger, you're supposed to allow it all. Let the brats be the brats. Let them beat you up. Turn the other cheek. Well, when is which what? When do you fight? And when you stand there and let yourself be hit. When are you when are you actually loving unrighteousness versus actually being unrighteous, which is not the idea? How do you navigate all this minefield of life? Yeah, it's a killer. But all that's the ruling function and what you're finding out when you go through it is first of all see how much higher the spiritual life is because you're learning how to be supra-human. Superhuman, I should say, not supra. You're learning to become superhuman because you're thinking the way God does. Absolutes. Ever progression toward absolute. And at the same time, it's all in your head. What you do is, is almost irrelevant. If your thoughts are right, then your actions are going to fit. Because your body just follows thought. That you can have action that's, you know, deemed moral and good and nice, but the thought behind it is, is um, pure sin, so to speak. And there's no such thing as even pure sin. But then that would wreck the, the value of the action. Depends on the attitude behind it. So you're navigating the minefield. You're actually learning to love righteousness. You're learning how to see through God's eyes. You're learning how to, to see people as they really are. You're learning how to grapple with the fact that, you know what, you're growing in there or not. And it's a killer life. And all at the same time, every day that's bought for the brats... It's being bought in part because you're sitting there learning and living on Bible. Which they won't respect and will actually resent. And therefore, every single day you're learning to love. You Literally, this is what happens. You literally develop a taste for righteousness. That nothing else will satisfy. Getting all the money in the world won't satisfy. Being deprived of everything... You know, we often think, you know, we're deprived of sleep or food, and that's going to happen. We're deprived of sleep or food or friends or money or whatever. We start, we, we, the brain naturally starts thinking, well, if I just had those things, I'd be happy. But you won't. That's the weird thing about the deprivation. God puts you through a lot of deprivation in cycles. And while you're in it, you're thinking, well, if I just had this thing I now lack... I'd be happy. What you're really looking for is comfort because, you know, deprivation makes you uncomfortable. But the weird thing is, is that once you start to get it, it doesn't make you happy. And the weirdest thing is that all of a sudden if he reverses your, your situation and now you have, you know, like everything you ever wanted in life, your dream come true, it's unsatisfying. 
only what's righteous satisfies. And it, it really ends up becoming that. It's a it's an enjoyment of going after the right thing just because it's right. And that's where the satisfaction is. And there doesn't have to be any other kind of reward or benefit or even success. Just going after it for its own sake is the only thing that satisfies. And that's where God is with it. And he's that way, you know, absolutely. And you get that way more and more with all these brats in the background. And they get more and more irritating to be around. Because their ideas of righteousness are so substandard. Their lifestyle, their scope of thinking, the words out of their mouth, their their whole set of ideas is so puny. And of course it becomes progressively less satisfactory to be around them. And yet there's this new satisfaction that grows. You start getting up in the morning because... Well, all these brats need you. This is one of the things that he calls to my mind the most. Because I have a real hard time with this part of the spiritual life. The body needs it. Now he's taking different parts of scripture when he says that. He's keying off the the thing where, you know, he sends in, what was it, Peter and John into town to, to get the Passover ready. And one of the things they had to do was that there was a mare, an, a, an ass, meaning a mare, okay, and her foal that were tied up outside some, I don't know, tavern or something. And they were supposed to untie it and take them both to him. And he instructed, uh, I guess it was Peter and John, um, that if anybody said, hey, what are you doing taking the, those, you know, the ass and, and her fall? Um, what are you doing taking them? And they were supposed to reply to the askers. The Lord has need of it. That's all they had to say. And apparently that was some, you know, kind of really big deal for the people who heard it. Well, now he's taking that same situation, that same part of the story, and he keeps saying... The body needs it. The body needs it. The body needs it. The body needs it. And yeah, the body's a brat. And yeah, the body should have learned Bible doctrine but didn't. And yeah, the body should have grown after being exposed to Bible for 35 years like I was. But they didn't hear even, it seems like they never even heard one class. But the body still needs it. It doesn't matter that it's their fault that they're childish. And it is. In spiritual life, if you're childish, it's your fault. It's because you didn't want to learn. Now bear in mind that if you've only been a Christian for like two years or five years, you're going to be childish and that's normal. Don't fault yourself for that. But if you've been a Christian for like 30 years and you're still dealing with the basics and arguing over what salvation is, you're retarded. I feel bad about that and kick yourself around the room for like 90 seconds. Use 1 John 1 9 and get, get learning. And there are a lot of people who are like that. They've been Christians all their lives and they wouldn't know the Bible if it bit them. Okay? They're brats. It's their fault that they're brats. It's not God's fault. It's not part of normal learning to be a baby, a spiritual baby, you know, past your number of years, which is supposed to be roughly analogous to the number of years it takes to grow as a human being. You know, if you're if you're 50 going on 12, it's your fault. Okay, cry about it for 90 seconds. Use one John 9 and get, get, get cracking. But you can't blame anybody else for it. In this life, you could, you know, blame a lot of failures on somebody else. That's kind of hard to do, because most failures are still volitional. But in spiritual life, there's nobody else to blame but you, because God does all the growing. God does all the growing in you. You just say yes. So if you're not grown, you didn't say yes. Okay, but for those who did say yes, they got to live with all these screaming babies. And that's not easy. 
It's really not. Okay, but you're learning loyalty down. Just like God came down and saved us. You're learning parenting. You're learning toleration. You're learning all kinds of skills. But above all, you're learning this sort of superhuman... I don't know how to explain it. A superhuman love of righteousness. You're doing it just because. You're not doing it to be accepted. You're not doing it because it's moral. You're not doing it because it's polite or politically correct. Or, you know, whatever other reasons that humans have for putting up with each other. You're doing it because it's right and that's what you actually love. You come to love doing it because it's right. And you never achieve anything. That's one big idea in Christianity that's really got to get knocked down. There is no achievement in the spiritual life. None. Zero. You are never going to be a better person than you were the day you were born. Nothing you do is ever going to count for God. Nothing you become is ever going to count for God. You can't do a truly good deed yourself at all at any time, 100% of the time. You can do a whole lot of things that please your ego or someone else's. But you can't do squat for God at any time, any way, any place. Nothing you do will ever be anything but doo-doo, period. Total waste of time. But when you wake up in the morning versus when you go to sleep at night, you can learn something more about God today. You can go through the practice. This is how John talks about it. He calls it practicing righteousness in the book of 1 John. It's really cool. You can practice righteousness. That's like practicing piano. Over, 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 over again. And then the day ends and you start up the next day. La, 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 la. Well, you're not going to want to do scales for very long if you don't love it. And that's the way it gets with this righteousness thing with the brats in the background. And you just, it's the right thing to think. It's the right attitude to have. God is listening. I want to learn. It's the right thing to do. Just because. And that's what he's developing the most. So that you can see through his eyes. And what that does is it provokes a kind of love for everything you hate. It's the weirdest thing. I mean, I, I, I see it happening. And I'm way far behind the eight ball. Um, you know, if I were to grade myself on the spiritual life, I think I'd give myself something like a C- minus or worse. Especially on execution. Maybe it's mostly a D-. minus. But for all that, I actually can't be satisfied anymore. Um by anything in this life. The only thing that makes me happy at the end of the day is I did something that I ought to do. I thought something I ought to think. I learned something I ought to learn. And it still doesn't count for anything with God. I'm trying to explain what's satisfying. When you get to the end of the day and you put your head down on a pill, what made that day worthwhile to you? The more you grow in the Christian life, there's only one thing that satisfies. You went after something just because it was right. You thought about something just because it was right. You wanted something just because it was right. And it's not that pat yourself on the back, I was a good boy today. I'm talking about the satisfaction of going after righteousness the same way you'd be satisfied cooking a good meal. 
the day doesn't taste good unless you got to like throw yourself at righteousness it's a taste thing you develop a taste for it it has absolutely nothing to do with being a good person being right or wrong or thinking well of yourself or somebody else it's very much a taste issue now, I mean, I want to really stress that part, and then I'll close. Think of your favorite food. And I'm going to give my example, perennial example, peanut butter, because most people like it. You know. I absolutely love peanut butter. And when I'm eating peanut butter, honey, I'm in seventh heaven. And I'm thinking about the taste and the crunchiness and rolling it, you know, you roll it on your tongue, you hold it in your mouth a little longer to stay for it. All the things you do when you're really tasting something. That's the way God thinks about righteousness. That's the way you come to think about righteousness. It so totally stops being about being a good person or doing a good deed. It just tastes good. Righteousness just tastes good and progressively, everything else doesn't taste good anymore. Or it derives any pleasure in its taste from the fact that the righteousness was got done first, cross before crown. And we all know that feeling from very early on in life. You know, you, you, you ate your peas and you ate the cauliflower or the broccoli or the Brussels sprouts and you and you finished your plate so now you can have dessert and honey that's when dessert tastes the best when you had to sit at a dinner that you didn't want to sit through but you went through it and you went through it because it was the right thing to do and now you get dessert and oh it tastes so good that's how righteousness tastes to God like dessert all this effort that he's going through is for the sake of the righteousness so he can get that dessert at the end. To him, it is not tasty unless all that upfront stuff is first. It's just not tasty. You know, we can talk all day about, you know, the other advantages and benefits of righteousness. But the first thing is that it's tasty. And that same sense of taste accrues in you despite the 5-year-olds, the 10-year-olds, the overwhelming majority 12 to 20-year-olds, even if ostensibly and chronologically they're going on age 50 and 60 and 70 and should know better. That's saying a lot and that is superhuman. Because human beings can't put up with human beings like this. But increasingly, your motive to do it, even as it began when you were five years old, I should be nice to people. I should do for people. Well, you're thinking that way when you're spiritually mature too. But it tastes good to do that. It's not, it's not so much because it's a norm or standard. It's because you just want to. And you're not satisfied unless you do. So hopefully I've given you enough, um, rounded out enough about this war for independence. And especially culminating in this love for God, love for seeing through his eyes, and especially love for righteousness. True, genuine love like, oh, this is my favorite food. Not love like, oh, I'm such a good person because I love righteousness. It's not like that at all. It's something you don't want to live without. It's something that's tasty to you. And life has no meaning to you. Unless you can eat it. When you get to that point. You're really living the way God does. And you won't be thinking that that's what you're doing. You'll be too busy enjoying it. Even while you grunt and groan. So hope I've. 
giving you the taste of where it goes and especially the weakness of it because you know when you really love something you sort of go weak in the knees oh I gotta have this yeah then you're maturing in weakness because when you're weak you'll do anything to get the object that you love it's very much like an addiction except you're rational then you're matured in weakness and that's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. God's power is made operational, really made complete in weakness. Well, what's weakness? Oh, this thing is so tasty, I just got to have it. Yeah, you're weak, you're love struck, you're addicted. Call it what you will. I got to have it. Mm hmm then you're weak, and then you're strong. Peace out.